continue to deal with Romans chapter 5. We're still in the first cornerstone of the, of the book of Romans, the first cornerstone of the foundation of our edification as we go through this process that our Father has uh, beautifully designed and beautifully crafted and put together for us in not only the whole entire Bible, but as, uh, through our Apostle Paul as well, uh, Romans through Philemon. And uh, this, this portion that we're in is, is so critical because it really is the, the segue between the, the connection, the, the mortar, as it were, between the, the bricks of, the, of justification, what we've been dealing with in Romans chapters 1 through 4 and chapter 5 up till now, to what we'll be getting into uh, in Romans chapter 6. And, and it's, it's hard because, I, if you remember way back when we started Romans, I provide that outline of those four cornerstones, four major sections. And all those, those things are helpful to kind of help to receive the information and kind of see it uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a certain perspective. Uh, another way, in another sense, that's not good because it just flows. And it just has a beautiful uh, designer behind it who's put it together just like he like painted a canvas and, 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 and just the, the stroke of his brush has really just put it together beautifully. And although you have uh, chapters in your book, these things were letters. They didn't have chapters in them when they were originally written. Uh, but as they were written down and uh, the way in which they needed to be written down and, and marked to keep track of where they were in the scrolls and whatever they were uh, copying them from, uh, they need to put the chapter and verse in there. And so, but it, it, it flows beautifully, Romans chapter 5 and what we're in right now into chapter 6. And I just, by, by, to get us going this morning, I want you to see that. Um, the beauty of this, and when we started looking at Romans chapter 5, we saw there the issue of we have access. And what we talked about when we had, uh, in, in, in correlation that we have access into this grace where we stand is that we now have an unlimited, unrestricted relationship with our Heavenly Father, with God. We have peace with Him and we have this access. Uh, but that term access still really implies and demands that we utilize that access, that we take full advantage of that unlimited relationship and that unrestricted uh, uh, relationship that we have to God. Uh, you can, again, you can have the key but you can choose not to use the key. Uh, and I always think about the, you know, those swipe cards you know, that they now have. You just put it up, beep, and the door is open. And that's your access card. And we have the access into all, everything that God has provided for us in Christ. But we've got to utilize that. Well, the beauty of that is when we get into Romans chapter 5, and as we're coming down, even though we're uh, only halfway through, really, but we're coming down to this last section, the beauty of it is that you have, and you can see on the next page or maybe the same page, you have Romans chapter 6. And the, the, the beauty of just most fundamentally thinking about that is that God didn't just die, he sent his son to die on the cross to justify you, to declare you righteous in his sight. If that's all he did, if that's all he provided for, then really our edification, well, there wouldn't really be an edification, but all we would need is Romans chapters 1 through 5. But he's done much more than just provide to justify you. And later on, when you go in Paul's epistles, he kind of takes Romans and kind of sums it up and encapsulates everything in just a couple verses. Well, let's see that real quick. Come with me to Ephesians. I just want you to see this. We were not just, Christ did not die on the cross just to justify us, or only to justify us, or provide justification through the redemption that he performed for us on the cross. But rather, that justification was a legal issue that God had to take care of to get us to his ultimate goal, aim, and objective. For us to be a son and daughter of God, for us to think the way he does, to, for us to live the way in which he would live, and for us to labor with him in his business. And if you want to type, if you want to sum up that whole issue of thinking like he does, living like he does, and laboring with him in his business, that would, you could put that on the issue of godliness, but also what comes from that godliness is good works. Good works that now you're not mustering up in your flesh, 
but good works that come from walking after the Spirit, and we'll eventually get into all that, but that therefore are coming from Him. And they are good that, that we can bring forth fruit unto righteousness. We can actually, not, we're eventually going to be able to do things, do works that are pleasing unto Him. And it's going to take place by not being under the law, but being under grace. It's going to take place by not walking after the flesh, but walking after the Spirit. And knowing what those things are. And that's what he ever created us to be, to do, is to labor with him in his business, to do things just like Adam before he fell. And we'll, we're going to eventually deal with Adam a lot uh, as we go down through chapter 5. But it's like Adam before he sinned. It wasn't that Adam was not working, he was laboring with God. He was naming the animals, he was keeping in uh, the garden, and, and, and a whole host of things he was doing with God. Uh, and then when he fell, in order for him to be justified now, to be declared right in God's sight, it was not going to be by his works. It was going to be by God doing it for him. And even when it came into now laboring with God, even before he fell, laboring with God, it wasn't he was just doing whatever he would. Oh, I'll do this. God will think this is great. No. God said name the animals, and therefore he named them. He was led by what God was telling him, and he followed suit. And therefore, that was pleasing to God. And therefore, when we get later on in our edification, we're not just going out there and just doing whatever we want to do and hoping that we can find out what's pleasing to God. No, His Spirit leads us and explains to us what's pleasing. And when we follow suit, it's the leading of the Spirit according to the Word of God, and therefore we can do things pleasing unto God. And so even in our sanctification, how to live unto God does not come from our own thoughts, our own abilities. It comes from the Word of God explaining how to walk after the Spirit and how to uh, bring forth the fruit of the Spirit. But look at this, just kind of summed up in Ephesians chapter 2. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, a common passage, but the verse we're going to look at is often kind of left out of this common passage. Ephesians 2, look at verse 8. We're just kind of jumping in here, but he says, For by grace are ye saved through faith. Past tense. He's already educated the Ephesians about this. He gave them Romans doctrine. They know about this, but he's, he's, wrapping, he's summing it all up. He says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So when it comes to being saved, uh, and that's saved unto eternal life, that's by God's grace. And, that, and it's through faith, that non-meritorious non response, all the merit goes to the object of the, uh, of the, of the faith that's in. Um, but notice what he says there. He says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Verse 10. For we, further explanation and amplification upon why we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? works. And if you think that in the dispensation of the grace of God, and if you think under grace, there's no works, there's no responsibility, there's no commitment, well, you don't understand what God's grace is. And this is the whole objective of why you're justified. You cannot be justified by your own works, nor can you be sanctified by your own works. But once God does justify you, and once God does sanctify you, he gives you the capacity to do good works. And again, these good works are not just any old good works. It's not just, oh, I'm just going to go do this. That's going to be good. Look what he says as he describes these good works, the rest of verse 10. Which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He's already ordained. He's already come up with the good works in which we do. We just walk in them. And therefore, again, all the praise, honor, and glory can only go to Him. Because even the good works that we're going to partake in, He's ordained them already. Well, that's just to kind of sum that up. But look at, uh, come with me to one more passage. Um, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. And I just bring this up again because as we go into Romans 5 here and again start dealing with this passage that we'll probably be dealing with for uh, quite some time, I want you to be able to have back in your mind and in your frame of reference that this issue that we're going to be looking into 
is so powerful and, and is, it's ought to be so impactful to your inner, inner man, so effectual that what it's designed to do is, is create that joy in God, but also to produce within you the desire, the enthusiasm, um, the, the willingness, the commitment, the responsibility that I want to serve him. What he's provided for me, I want to live unto him now. And that's what it ought to do. And if it doesn't, then you, you need to go back and get it. Or we need to go, as an assembly, need to go back and make sure we get it. That's why I'm trying to tell you all these things before we get into it. That's the exhortation. So that when we get in it, you, you, every little detail is adding to that ultimate purpose. Is to work in you that, man, this is so great. This is so wonderful. This is so powerful that I want to live unto him. That I want, to, I want to serve him in every detail of my life, every aspect of my life. The very thing, I, and, and, and maybe we don't know what that looks like right now, which we, we really wouldn't. But whatever he's going to describe to me, whatever he's going to tell me, whatever he's going to instruct me in, re relating to the details of my life, my marriage, my friendships, work, uh, how I look at the government that's un uh, over me, uh, how I look at the local assembly. That I want to line myself up with it because of what he's provided me. I want to do that. And that's what the, that question posed in, in Romans 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And I used to always look at that verse and say, man, Paul's just, he's, he's, he's thinking about the, those rascals there maybe at Romans. And then I started thinking about that more. I'm like, no, that's a legitimate question based upon what we're going to see. And, and that, that's a legitimate question. That what that person wants asking that question that Paul's anticipating is they want the grace of God to abound in their life. And what they've learned in Romans is that grace abounded when sin much more abounded. So if we get the grace abounding, then just maybe we should sin more. All I want is the grace to abound. And Paul says, nope. That's not how you get the grace of God to abound. But then he's going to get into how you have that grace abound in your life. How to live unto him. Well, look at Colossians 2, another couple verses that kind of just um, talk about that God not only provided for us to be justified, but a lot more than that. Um, look at verse 5, Colossians 2, look at verse 5. He says, for, for though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Join and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. That implies a whole lot, but look at verse 6. He says, as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord. And that's that issue there, receive Christ. That, he's going to utilize that terminology in Romans uh, 6, talking about Romans 1 through 5. The issue of we've received the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. We believe the, 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 the gospel which was delivered unto us. We believed it and therefore have been justified. So then he says, as you've therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. There's a walk. There's a lot more than just justification that he's provided us. Uh, provided us. So look at verse 7. Rooted and built up in him. And that's what Romans 5, 11 through 12, 21 is doing. It's it's taking, we're already rooted, but it's, it's like he's coming along and, and, and making sure it's all the, 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 uh, the environment for that seed to take place. It's, it's rooted. It's, and, and he goes on and he says, and, and built up in him, that's anticipating what we're going to get. But that rooted issue, that's really what's taking place. That roots, they're, they're down there. And so that nothing can really can take place. He's using the, uh, the, the imagery of, of a plant here, but that can uproot you that's what Romans 5 11 through 21 is doing is that you're so rooted that nothing can uproot, uproot, uproot you it's almost like if you had a plant and you had the cement on top of it and you can't get that plant up unless you broke it off at the stem my imagery and my analogies don't go as well as what's taking place but you can't uproot that maybe you could break off the stem but the roots are still in there that's what Romans 5, 11 through 21 is designed to do. He says, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. So we're getting in there, and then there's an the issue of abounding therein with thanksgiving. Well, come with me back now to Romans chapter 5. 
just to look at a couple verses again, as, as we just did, in regards to if you, if you took Romans and broke it down into two verses, well, there's two passages that do that, do that very thing. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, uh, and Colossians 2 there. And that's what's going on here. Our Father wants us to joy in Him. Look again at verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. He wants us to joy in him. And in order to produce that joy in him, he's going to describe the atonement and the nature of that atonement and the, the uh, significance of that atonement and the, 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 the power of that atonement in the, in the verses that follow. Um, this passage... Along, along with some other ones, but this passage, a failure to understand this passage, can I, I'm just trying to bring up the gravity of what we're getting. A failure to understand this passage can lead to many profane doctrines. It is my understanding, a failure to understand this passage, it's kind of like the, you can misunderstand some other passages, but if you misunderstand this one, this, is what, this one would be the last one. If you didn't get this one down, then you're, you're just in the woods. But a failure to understand this passage can lead you off into profane doctrines, universalism, uh, Calvinism, universalism that everyone is saved. Since Christ died, everyone's going to be saved. Universal, universal salvation can lead you down to Calvinism. Calvinism actually is a form of universalism. They wouldn't say that by any means, but it, it, Calvinism basically says that God saved some of the uh, uh, saved some people. He elected some people, and he didn't elect some other ones. Some he saved for eternal life. Some he he didn't save, and and he has every right to do that. And what you know, whatever they what, whatever they say, but it's a form of universalism in the sense that they come along and they say that well, Christ died only for the elect. And so it's a different type of universal. He only he universally died for the elect, but nevertheless, that's who he only, that's who he only died for. He didn't die for every man, and that's not what this passage teaches, nor what the the passages before taught us. We're taught that Christ does die to provide justification for everyone. So therefore, the provision is universal. He died for everyone. And we're going to see that it has to be that way. Because he, other passages we'll eventually see in 1 Corinthians there, uh, in, in chapter 15, he says, for if all, or, or 2 Corinthians 5, he says, for if all were dead, then he died for all. If he died for all because all were dead. That's the logic behind that. And if all were dead, in which all were dead, and that's what we're going to we're learning in Romans chapter 5, if all were dead, then Christ, in order to at least match that judicial power of all being dead, he had to die for all. And therefore, if you come along and say he didn't die for all, he only died for elect, that means that only some were dead. Well, now you've got a big problem on your hands. Well... That will make more sense as we get into this, but because we'll deal with that, because I don't want you to be beguiled by those things. But understanding this passage can lead to profane and erroneous doctrines. And what God, our Heavenly Father, wants to do is for you to joy in Him, knowing that you can never lose your justification unto eternal life. There's nothing you can do. You're stuck. And, and, and what that's designed to do is give you a purpose, give you a reason, give you the motivation, the zeal, the enthusiasm, whatever term you want to use to describe it, to live unto him because of what you now possess. The eternal value of what you now possess is not worthy to be compared with any temporal value that you might have in your life. That's how great of what we have. And that's how great the information we're going to get uh, in this section. Now, last time we left off dealing with the, the atonement. Uh, and I want to just briefly review, look at one verse in connection with what, what I brought out last lesson. Look again at Romans 5, verse 11. He says, Not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. And there's, that's, that, that terminology is so significant. 
because what, that's what you have there, the atonement. And I say, it, you know, you have those two different ways you can pronounce it, T-H-E, the or the. And I like saying the because it, it's singling it out. And that's in contrast to the passages we looked at in Exodus, Leviticus. We'll look at one in 2 Chronicles here where it talks about N, atonement. And when you have an N atonement, N atonement, that's implying that there's what? Yeah. More. There's more than one. Come over with me um, to 2 Chronicles chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29. And just look at this. Again, last lesson, we looked at a few verses in connection with this. And as we go through this, I want to talk about why God, when he instituted the law, and that law covenant came into play, why he gave them atonements, and why he gave them the day of atonement, <clears throat> and what that was designed to do with the nation of Israel. Second Chronicles chapter 29 and look at verse 24 with me. We'll start up there in verse uh, 22. He says, So they killed the bullocks, and the priests received the blood, and sprinkled it on the altar. <clears throat> Likewise, when they had killed the rams, they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. They killed also the lambs, and they sprinkled the blood upon the altar. And they brought forth the goats for the sin offering before the king and the congregation. And they laid their hands upon him. And the priest killed them. And they made reconciliation with their blood upon the altar to make an atonement for all Israel. Notice, to make an atonement for all Israel. For the, the king commanded that the burnt offerings and the sin offerings should be made for all Israel. Now again, I just bring your, I go to this passage because both the word reconciliation and atonement are used. Uh, you don't have to hold your hand here, but you can go back to Romans 5. Just to, again, have your eyes glance down at the context of what we're dealing with in Romans chapter 5. And what we just got done dealing with. Look at Romans 5. Look at verse 9. He says, much more than being now justified by his what? His blood. You just read about all the blood of the, the bullock, the goats, and the lambs there in that second chronicle passage. Now we're talking about the blood, his blood, the son's blood. And then he, he goes on, we shall be saved from wrath through him, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were what? Reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then he gets into the next verse and he talks about at the end there, we have now received the atonement. So he's talking about reconciliation, he's talking about atonement. And so again, the issue of reconciliation is a change of status. We, we were at, before the status we had, we were enemies. We were at odds with God. We dealt with that in, in chapter 5, verse 1. We have peace with God now. That means we didn't have peace with Him before. We had a relationship filled with enmity. And we were enemy. There's hostility between us and God. And we're, we're the enemies of God. And therefore, in order to change that status, we need to be reconciled. And when we're reconciled, our status goes from whatever it was to something different. And so now we're, we were enemies and now we're no longer enemies. The significance of what Paul's now going to deal with is he's going to describe the nature of that reconciliation. Because there, in 2 Chronicles 29 that we just looked at in passages before that, those sin offerings did make reconciliation. It was an atonement. But the nature of that reconciliation, the nature of that atonement is not the same as what we're dealing with here. Now we've received the atonement. And that implies, just understanding the terminology, the atonement compared to an atonement, is that these an atonements did not get the job done. They did get a job done, but not, they didn't get the job done. They didn't provide for permanent reconciliation. But the atonement provides for permanent reconciliation. That's what the atonement is. An atonement is, describes reconciliation, but it describes, the, it describes the permanent nature of it. And therefore, this 
atonement, even back in the Old Testament, under the law, when it's used, it's describing a permanency. But the permanency only goes as far as the, the value and the, the significance of the blood that it's in. And the blood of bulls and goats, we're going to see, has no significance. When that redemption or that sin offering needed to take place, the one being redeemed, we're, we're, we're a man. And therefore, when we need to be redeemed, when we need to uh, have a reconciliation, the blood, therefore, we need is not the blood of bulls and goats. It's the blood of, of, a, of another man in a, in a specific man whom God is going to uh, describe who that man is. And all, that, all that just docked that in the back of your mind. And so they had an atonement, but it wasn't the atonement. They had the blood of bulls and goats, but it wasn't the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, the permanency of that atonement only really lasted until they killed the, the, they killed the animal, and then they go back out and sin, and they just need to keep offering this, the blood of bulls and goats. This one only has to take place once. And even though you sin afterward, it doesn't matter. All he had to die, would do was he had to die once. Now, come with me over to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, we looked at this last time, but I want to get your mind going on it again. Hebrews chapter 9. Uh, in this section, in the book of Hebrews, one of the major things that the writer of Hebrews does is he compares the Old Covenant with the New Covenant. The Old Testament with the New Testament. And as we've dealt with before, in connection with what Paul says there in Romans chapter 1, the spirit of holiness, that spirit of holiness is, is the New Testament. The spiritual provisions of the New Testament that we, those that believe in the gospel of Christ today, we become beneficiaries of. We, we, we are partakers in their spiritual things. Not their physical things, but their spiritual things. And that New Testament provided Israel with spiritual fitness to be utilized by God in that kingdom. And therefore, that spiritual fitness issue, we've become a beneficiary of. And as Paul continues to go on and educate us, the spiritual fitness is not to be utilized with us to reconcile the earth through that kingdom. But that spiritual fitness now is going to be utilized by God with us to reconcile the heavenly places uh, and, and the, the kingdom up there, as it were. And so we are beneficiaries. We are able ministers of that New Testament that spirit of holiness. Um, and so, but, but here, in Hebrews, he's got to, he compares the old and the new because Israel was specifically, in a very direct way, underneath the law. Whereas with us, even though Paul talks about the law, he doesn't come along and talk about that we were under it in a very direct way. So he doesn't have to describe all the things that he's describing, as the writer of Hebrews does. But what I want you to see in Hebrews 9, that when we get our mind thinking about when Israel was under the law, and they, were, they had these sacrifices, and they had these in atonements, and they had to offer the blood and bulls and goats, what that was all about. And what I want you to see is what that was all about was to educate them about something that they should have learned before they were even under the law. And those that are able to come on Thursdays, these should start clicking about what we've just been going over, and we're going to start to, to deal with that. But look at Hebrews chapter 9. Look at this, how he's comparing it. Look at Hebrews 9, verse 1. He says, oh, look, jump up there in verse, uh, chapter 8. In verse 8, he talks about how, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, I will make a new covenant. And then he goes on and describes it. Look at verse 13 of chapter 8. He says, in that he saith a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth waxeth old is ready to vanish away. And that's what's going to be taking place out here. That's what was taking place. That's what's going to begin to take place during the day of wrath. The old covenant is waxing old as the new one becomes to be more and more in power and force. And the old one is, is waxing away. And so the, that Hebrews doctrine is fitting to at this time. Paul wouldn't say that. He says the, the, the old one is, is abolished. It's done away with in this dispensation of grace. Um, 
But look at what he goes on to say now in chapter 9, verse 1. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances, a divine service and a worldly sanctuary. And he's going to talk about that. But come down now to verse 6. He's talking about the service of the priests. He says, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying. The Holy Ghost was signifying something. He was teaching something when that was taking place. That the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was standing along with all of its services and sacrifices, it was signifying that the, the way in which you, you, you get to God was not yet made manifest. Verse 8, or verse 9, which was a what? Figure. That's going to be interesting, because that same terminology, figure, is used in Romans chapter 5 in connection with Adam. Adam was a figure. But it, uh, he goes on to say, which was a figure... For the time then present, so back here when it came into play, it was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices, that which we just read in Second Chronicles, that could not, get that, that could not make him that did the service perfect. The priest that went in there and he offered the, the, the blood for himself and for the heirs of the people, it could not make him perfect. It didn't get the job done. That, those atonements couldn't get the job done. And they were never designed to get the job done. They were designed to signify something. They were designed, we're going to see with Paul in Galatians, they were designed to teach them something. Look what he goes on to say in verse 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks, all that the priests had to do, with, and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. And it's interesting because the writer of Hebrews is talking about the significance of the old to the new and the new being greater and more perfect in, their, in this context. And Paul is going to do a similar thing in, in our context. And he's, going to, he's, got, he's going back all the way to the source, Adam. And what God did with Adam and, 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 and the significance, the, the similarity between Adam and Christ, and then, which is really only like one, and everything else is not similar because of what Christ has done is, is greater and much more better and perfect. But he goes on, he says, a more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. For, uh, uh, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy temple, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. And that's what God did. He was purifying the flesh. But the purifying of the flesh demands that you continue to sanctify. You continue to offer these blood sacrifices. And you've got to keep doing it. You've got to keep doing it. And God's just forbearing all that. For the, for the time then present. But then he goes on. Verse, thir, uh, verse 14. How much more. Notice that same kind of terminology. Much more. How much more shall the blood of Christ. Who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God. Purge your conscience from, a, from dead works to serve the living God. So back there. In verse 9, the gifts and sacrifices, the blood of bulls and calves, they could not make the, him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. It couldn't make him perfect. But the blood of Christ did purge their, your conscience from dead works to serve the living God, verse 14. Now that's in connection with the priest. Look at chapter 10. Look at chapter 10, look at verse 1. He says, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come. They were just a shadow, just a figure. 
and not of the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So it couldn't make themselves perfect and the ones that came unto them that they offered for, the priests offered the sacrifices for the people, it couldn't make the comers thereunto perfect either. For then, verse 2, because if it did, for then would they not have ceased to be offered. Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. If it did its job, then they wouldn't have to offer any more sacrifices. It would, they would only have to offer it once. Sound familiar? The Lord Jesus Christ he offered himself once. And there's no more sacrifice for sins after that because he dealt with it once. Verse 3. But in those sacrifices, in the ones of the, the, the sacrifices, plural, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. And he describes the Davidic covenant and what God wants to do and the prophesying of the Lord Jesus, Christ, Lord Jesus Christ coming and that God doesn't desire the sacrifices and offerings of, of, of the blood of bulls and goats, but he wants a body prepared for him. The body of the Lord Jesus Christ to be the sacrifice. That's the only thing fitting. That's the atonement. So then why does God, if these things cannot purge the conscience from dead works, these atonements and atonements, if they can't get the job done, why does God give them? He gives them to teach them about who they are, who God is, and to teach them about their, the predicament that they're in. And this is what we've been going over on Thursdays. You need to understand what the purpose of the law is. There's a lot of purposes the law has. But when it comes in connection with justification, when it comes into being declared right in God's sight, those sacrifices never did it. Now, I want to get your mind going. Come back with me to, uh, let's go back to Romans. And folks, there were some in Israel who understood this. There were some in Israel, such as David, many others, Daniel, who understood that that sacrifice could not take away their sin. But because they're under the law, they did it anyways. Because it was a contract, because it was a covenant. They, there, there was something that law did in connection with justification. It taught them because in, it, 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 every time they offered it, it brought again that remembrance of sin. And it's just a hashing. It's, it's the knowledge of sin, as Paul calls it. It just brings up in your mind, man, I can't get rid of this stuff. I can't get rid of sin. I can't deal with it, and neither does these blood of bulls and goats. Otherwise, I wouldn't have to offer them anymore. And they would recognize that, and they would recognize the only way in which my sins are going to be dealt with is, God, you have to do it for me. You've got to do it. And as soon as they recognize that, and that's what their faith was in, God, you've got to do it for me, God justified them. He forbeared until the Lord provided what he did on the cross, but he justified them on credit, as it were knowing what his son was going to come do. Again, however, because he's under law contract, he still has to do it. Because part of that law was, it was part of their national laws. Just like our laws now, we have to keep them in our country. But look at this. We dealt with this before. If you remember, I'm trying to bring it back into our minds. Look at Romans 3. Look at verse 19. He says, Now we know that what things... Soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. It was given directly to Israel, but we're going to see as we go on in our studies that it also had the design to do something to the world at large. And that's why Paul can come along and say, it was, it was it saith to them who are under law, but then he goes on, he says, that every mouth may be stopped. 
It was given to Israel, and Israel did something with that law in connection with the whole world. And he says that their mouth, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now look at verse 21. He says, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. And what I want you to see, we'll just do it like this. What you had under that old covenant there, and that compared to the new, is that there was the righteousness of God manifested, but it was manifested with the law. Now the new covenant is the righteousness of God manifested with, without the law. Sorry, that's diagonal and all that. But And what I want you to see, look what he goes on to say there. Again, verse 21, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. But look how, what he's going to go on to say. Being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What was being witnessed by the law and the prophets? The righteousness without the law. The law actually witnessed to the righteousness of God without it. Does that make sense? See some kind of looks. The righteousness with the law, the righteousness of God, witnessed to the righteousness of God that would one day that would come without the law, without performing, which would be the new covenant. Let's see if I can try to put it another way. Read that verse, I'll read that verse again one more time. It says, verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. The righteousness of God without me performing, without me doing works, is manifested. It's, it's made evident. It's made clear. We can see it. But that righteousness of God without me performing, without me doing it, was witnessed by the law and the prophets. There was a testimony of it given before it was manifested. It was made known in a sense before it was made manifest. Now I want you to see how this played out. And again, we went through all this, but we got it. I want you to get this down. In fact, go into chapter 4. A, a, a personal example of this is David. Look what he says here, um, chapter 4, look at verse 4. As again, in the context, we were dealing with the issue of faith and, and the, the, the law of faith, and it being the only thing in which God can accept in his courtroom. He says in verse 4, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him, that justifieth ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We have faith today in the gospel of Christ, and it's counted to us for righteousness. But look at how he's, who he's going to use to describe that. Verse 6, even. That word even, is, is, there's an equality. Even as David. David, who was what? Under the law. Even as David also describeth the blessings of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Saying, Psalm 32, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. David's under the law, and he's describing the blessedness of, the, of God's righteousness without the works. Now come with me to Galatians. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And just jump in here, verse 19. Paul's going to talk about Christ and Abraham's seed and, and Christ his Abraham's seed and all those things. And he's going to talk about the promise. And the promise was made to Abraham, which was 430 years before the law 
uh, and all these things. And then the question comes up, well, if it was given to Abraham by promise and all these things, then why, what's the purpose of the law? Verse 19. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of what? Transgressions. Till the seed, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a meteor. We'll eventually deal with the angels and all that in a little bit. Look at verse, jump down to verse 21. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law, in other words, the law, the, the promise of what they could get by the Lord Jesus Christ, even though he wasn't made manifest yet in all these things, they could still receive, we're just going to talk about in this sense, justification, even though the seed wasn't manifest yet. And they could get that justification based upon what the law, something the law did. The law then again, what, is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, eternal life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But it wasn't. Verse 22. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. Verse 23, But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. That law, again, get the terminology he's going to use here in verse 24. Wherefore, uh, he gives a mini summarization of the things that he's been dealing with. Wherefore, the law was our, what? Schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. And that Christ isn't his person. Because he's talking about before he actually came to this earth. When they were underneath that law, that law worked as a schoolmaster. And a schoolmaster educates you in something. And what that law did, I don't know why that happened. What that law did in educating them, it educated them that they were, as he said up there in verse 22, they were under sin. And when you talk about being under something, you're talking about a master or a subjection. And that sin is their master. They're under sin. And that law taught them that. And it did, as it taught them that, look at what it did again in verse 23. But before faith came, the faith of Jesus Christ, his cross work. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. And that's what I want you to see. And this, again, we've dealt with this before, but I want to make sure you have it. Because in this, you'll, we can see what the law did in connection with these atonements. Here, here you have the cross, okay? Now you have someone way back here who's under the law. Okay? Now what that law did before this, the faithfulness of Christ came... How were they justified? How were they given life? Well, that law educated, it was a schoolmaster, it taught them about their sin. And we saw that in the sacrifices, or Hebrews. There's a remembrance again of sin every year. Just a remembrance, always a constant reminder of that they're under sin. I'm a sinner. I sin. I sin. I got to keep doing these sacrifices. Man, it would just get boring. Not boring. It would, it, it, I'd be such a pessimist <laughs> probably back then. If I was just brought my sin all the time. That's what that did. That's what the sacrifices did. And when a person would come along and they would recognize their sin and that they can't, the sacrifices aren't actually providing them righteousness, they're just actually bringing a remembrance of their sin, they would come to the conclusion based upon the education of the law that gave them and the sacrifices and said, I can't do this. God, you got to do it for me. And that whole issue of recognizing, God, you got to do it for me, is the issue of that law bringing them unto Christ. Not his person, but the, 
and this is going to sound bad, but hopefully it gets my point across, the concept of Christ. Christ is the one, the means by which God's going to do for them that which they cannot do for themselves. And so when they recognize I can't do it, it's bringing them unto Christ. It's bringing them up to the capacity, I can't do it, God, you've got to do it for me. It's one of the main purposes of the law. It was not to justify them by faith plus works. It was to have them do the works and see I can't do the works. God, you've got to justify me apart from the works. The righteousness of God without the law was manifested, being, uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And the prophets, they proclaimed about the one who was going to come and do it for them. When the, when the prophets started proclaiming those things. And that's how they were justified, by faith alone. They were under that law being schooled by it. I don't know if you ever use that expression, but man, they, they use that back, at least when I was in school. Man, you got schooled, you know. You were taught a lesson, or you were embarrassed. You, something was brought up to your attention, it was so clear. And that's what that law did, it schooled them about who they were before God and that they couldn't do it. I, I, I want to show you an example, I just want to get this down, because it's so important to what we're going to be dealing with. Come with me to Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. And again, what I want you to see is those atonements were teaching them this issue. They were teaching them that they were under sin. And the significance of that for us in Romans chapter 5 is how did they get to be under sin? From Adam. Look at Daniel chapter 9. I just want you to show you how this kind of played out, how this kind of worked. Look at chapter 9, verse 1. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. Now, all this would be understood if we understood Leviticus 26, and that's what we've been dealing with on, uh, on Thursdays. But what I want you to see, in Leviticus 26, God gave courses of punishment. And those courses of punishment were to do the same thing. Teach them that they were under sin. Teach them that they couldn't keep the law. Teach them all they deserved was these curses, and the judgment of those curses was death. That's what they deserved. That's what they warranted in and of themselves. And it was just a year by year and, and throughout their history and their generations of that very thing. And they get to a point here under the fifth course of punishment, the last course of punishment Daniel's under, and he recognizes by Jeremiah and Leviticus 26 by reason of books that we're under the fifth course of punishment. And we're under it because of our sin. And the response that they were supposed to be getting, God knew they were going to give when they're under the first, uh, first, uh, first, fifth course of punishment, was a confession of that sin. And that's why he says, I made my confession. And he says, goes on, and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to, and to them that keep his uh, commandments, we have what? Sin. That law, those five courses of punishment, the sacrifices all taught Daniel, we have sinned and, and have committed iniquity. Iniquity is the same thing as sin, in the sen but in the sense of it's the abhorring thing in God's sight. It, he abhors it. It's a repulsion to him. And have committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings or our princes, and our fathers and to all the people of the land. He brings up the law and the prophets in those two verses. The covenant, the law, and now he brought up the, the prophets who witnessed to this very issue. Verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongeth unto thee. It brought him unto Christ. Not his personage. They didn't think Christ, 
they would think just your righteousness, God. Righteousness belongeth unto you. Two things there. They have sinned, committed iniquity, and done wickedly, and rebelled, and righteousness belongs unto you. And when Daniel made that confession, and, and, when, and even before that, but it's, it's being written down here, God justified him. He was justified by his faith alone in that schoolmaster of the law. We're not schooled by the schoolmaster of the law today. We get all, our whole gospel is up there in Romans chapter 1 through 5, and we just get into us plainly. But here it didn't. And he says again, verse 8, O Lord, to us belong, belongeth uh, confusion of face, to our kings, to our princes, and to our fathers, because we have sinned against thee. To the Lord our God belong mercies and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws, which he has set before us by his servants the prophets. Yea, all Israel have, have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. And he hath confirmed his words, which he spake against us, and against our judges that judged us. And he goes through the courses of punishment and saying, you, you, you gave a testimony against us. Your oath was, it was written down, and we, we, we should have known this because everything we were going through because we weren't keeping your laws. Now I want to show you one more thing. Come with me to Exodus 15. And I'll try to bring this all home in the next lesson. Exodus 15. God, when Israel's down in Egypt for the 400 years under the strange nation, the nation of Egypt, and that nation afflicts them for that, that 400 years, and after, when that time is up, God sends Moses to go deliver them. And God, when they're in Egypt, he educates them about his capacity to do for them that which they can't do for themselves. He comes along and he, he, he educates them in that way by... The, God poured out ten judgments upon Egypt. The first three Israel, uh, Israel went through just like the Egyptians. After that third one, he severs them. Separates them in the land of Goshen, and they don't experience the last seven. To educate them that they're no different than the Egyptians. They're, basically, they're under sin, just like the Egyptians. And the only way you're different is if I sever you, if I make you different. i got to do it for you. Well, they don't really learn from that. He brings them across the Red Sea, brings them on the other land, and now he starts to deal with them here in the wilderness of Shur. Uh, look at Exodus 15. Look at verse, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, uh, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink of the waters of Marah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Marah. Now jump down uh, to verse... 25, and he cried unto the Lord. The, the people were murmuring against Moses, and Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made them a statue and an ordinance, and there he what? Proved them. That's, he tested them. He educated them. That's what tests are. That's what the proving is in, 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 a lot of, in, in, in a lot of shades of meaning. It's an education he was educating them before they even got the law. He proved them. What did he prove them in? And there he proved them and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord, thy God will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to the commandments, uh, to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee. And that disease is if they would have drank of that water, guess what would have happened? They would have died. Upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. The only which, way, way in which you're going to live, and he's talking about spiritually here. They're alive physically. They're hanging on the, the skin, of the, you know, they're with, been without water, but they're still alive. He's talking about spiritually here. And what he's, he's coming along, he's saying, he's proving them, he's testing them. That if you do these commandments, then I will not put these diseases upon you. The next one, and as he goes on in uh, Exodus 16, is the issue of bread, and they fail that test. They can't keep the commandments regarding bread and, and educating them that they should get the diseases and they should die. 
And, and bef this is before they got the law. And what I want you to see is the law educated them about the same things they were educated in Egypt and right here. They're just going to learn the hard way now underneath that law. But it's going to school them in the same thing, that they're under sin and righteousness belongs unto God. And if it schooled them in that way, if they by faith recognize those things underneath the law, God would justify them by faith. And again, the significance of all that is what I want you to see is these end atonements, part of that law, educated them about being under sin and righteousness belongs unto them. Those atonements educated them. He was educating them about that before they even got the law. The problem of being under sin was, was there before the law. And therefore it came from somewhere. And, and Paul, instead of going back and talking about the law like I've been doing, that's all to, be, all to be understood. That's why I'm going through it right now. Paul, he goes back to the source. He goes back to the root when he talks about the atonement. And that's the one man, Adam. And that's where we've got to begin to focus our attention. Adam. And why he's given a one, a one man status. What is the one man status? And, and, and all those things, because what that's going to help us to understand is the security and the assurance and the much more grace of God of what we have in Christ compared to what we had in Adam. And that law, to put it in a very simplistic way, was to teach them that very thing, that they were in Adam, that they were under sin, that they were guilty before God, and the only way they could be right in his sight is if he did it for them. By his mercy, by his forgiveness. And therefore, now being beneficiaries of what Christ has done for us, we have now received the atonement, and that's going to bring to light a whole host of things. So that love of God is shed abroad in your heart, and you'll never question again whether you are, are, are saved. And that's what it was supposed to those end atonements, that was what they were supposed to do. Am I right in God's sight? Because they couldn't do it. They would just keep offering these year after year. But someone would learn that I can't be right by these sacrifices. Well, that's where we'll start to focus uh, next lesson. Let's, let's conclude in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time to get into your word and to go through this issue of the law's purpose, being a schoolmaster, and the significance of those atonements educating Israel that they were under sin, they were guilty before you, and only way in which they could be right in your sight is if you provided it yourself. Then that wasn't going to be in the issue of the blood of bulls and goats. And when they recognized that, they would, they would then become justified. And the significance of that is those atonements that they were under, were not under. We have received the atonement. And the issue of the atonement is the, the recognizing the, the value and the quality of of the atonement, not in the blood of bulls and goats, but in the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, the issue of the atonement being reconciled, we need to come to understand the, issue, the, the, the term reconciled implies that one needs reconciliation and that there was a predicament that one was in. And that predicament, although taught underneath the law, did not originate by them being under the law. It originated before the law. It or originated long before the law. It originated with the first man created, made. It originated with Adam. And that's where we need to start spending our time. And we thank you that you provide us information so that we can see the significance of Adam and Christ and the, the much more grace that is abound, that abounds toward us in what we have in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that love of God is to be shed abroad in our heart and we would have the much more assurance of our justification unto eternal life that not only seals and establishes us in the faith, but provides a motivation to live unto you. Father, we thank you for all these things. I do pray if someone's here listening and they have not trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, that they would trust in him this very moment, put their faith in what Christ has done for them, how that he died for their sins, was buried, and rose again. And the moment God sees their faith, trusting in his son, he'll justify them, meaning he'll forgive them all their sins, past, present, and future, and impute his righteousness unto them, and therefore they will possess the gift of eternal life. Why don't they believe this very moment? We thank you for this time of grace giving as well. 
We don't give grudgingly or on necessity, but willfully and cheerfully according to the effectual working of your word in us. To Christ's name we pray. Amen.